the scientific evidence for an old universe and Earth is so overwhelming that it is difficult to imagine any scenario in which it could be overturned. Hugh Ross. The idea that the Earth is very old is not a scientific consensus, it is a scientific conclusion. It is the conclusion that all of the evidence points to, and there's really no, there really isn't any serious scientific debate about it. It is hugely embarrassing that over half of our ministers really believe that the universe is only around 10,000 years old. This is just scientifically, it's nonsense. And yet this is the view that the majority of our pastors hold. And this was said 10 years ago, so uh, it might not even be a majority anymore. I would argue that it's not. These men, all believers, are among the vast majority in our world that treat the science that claims that evolution is true, that it's history, and that the earth is old as unquestionable fact. Consensus, even among believers, is that the earth is about 4.6 billion years old and the universe about 13.8 billion years old. But there's a, a problem with that, and the reason that I titled this message Rethinking the Science versus Young Earth Creationism Paradigm is that inherent in that statement that we see, science versus young earth creationism, is the idea that there's science on one hand and there's young earth creationism on the other and they're contrary to each other. Young earth creationism is anti-science, that it cannot be supported scientifically. So our job now as we bring the conference to a close, is to think somewhat conceptually about these things, to reframe our paradigm, and consider why all of this is so important. We're um, programmed from a young age to think that science is what we learn in the classroom. We, we perform these repeatable experiments in the lab every time the answer pointing to the same thing. And so we, we say science is valid, it's firm, it gives uh, valid conclusions that are always factual, right? And so with that concept of science, when we hear someone say, the science that says the earth is old is firm, how can we argue with that, right? Well, because it's a different kind of science, the, the science that's claiming an old earth and evolution is not repeatable, observable science, it relies on assumptions and interpretations of data as we try to put together what we cannot observe. No one was there to observe, so we have to rely on assumptions and interpretations. Nuclear physicist Vernon Cups put it this way, real science can make no definitive statements about the past because we cannot go back in time and observe what really happened. Real science is most succinctly defined as a systematic methodology for investigating natural phenomena. It has nothing factual to say about anything outside our ability to observe and record. Does that mean it's useless and we shouldn't do it? No, of course not. But it does mean that the sort of dogmatism that these believers have toward uh, claims of an old earth is completely unwarranted. As I'd like to, to point out, the science claiming that the earth is old and evolution is history is not nearly, not nearly, as reliable and conclusive as it is suggested to be. By definition, as theories from historical science, evolution and the age of the earth cannot be said to rely on observable evidence. So a paradigm shift is much needed, and with our remaining time, we're gonna to try to uh, frame that paradigm, if you will. And lastly, talk about why it's important, the paradigm that we have. So the first thing that I, I wanna point out is that there's no observable evidence of even a single organism changing kinds. I'm gonna piggyback off of some of the previous sessions. I'm thankful they did a lot of the work of explaining some of these things. For evolution to be true, we need to see a change of kinds at some point. We're not um, concerned with speciation. We need a change of kinds for evolution to be true. But there's no observable evidence for a change of kinds. 
The fossil record is put forward as one of the primary evidences of millions and billions of years of evolution because we find smaller, typically marine creatures toward the bottom of rock layers and larger ones as we go up. And that's suggested to be proof that life began with these smaller creature, creatures and uh, they evolved. We have the tree of life resulting in these larger ones toward the top, that these layers represent the passing of eons of time. But there's a huge problem, at least one huge problem that I'm gonna talk about. With that much time and that much change, there would have been fossil evidence of transitional forms, or at least transitional features on animals. That is, if evolution is true, we should see a significant number a significant number of fossils that have features representing a mix between kinds, things that don't fit into the kinds that we observe today. There should be tons of things that don't fall into those boundaries. Fish with scales, but also the development of human skin or other animal skin. Uh, land creatures developing the bone density and feathers that would be necessary for birds. These have been called missing links, and we hear that and we typically think uh, the missing link between chimps and humans, but in reality, they're missing links between every kind that was supposed to have morphed into another kind. Missing links. Emphasis on the word missing. Why are they missing links? We don't see them anywhere, these transitional forms. Now, there are some fossils that are put forward as transitional forms, but not without debate, even within the secular scientific community. That is, even uh, scientists that disagree, uh, that, that refute God's existence, de uh, debate over the transitionalness, if you will, of these fossils. Furthermore, even if the existence of 100,000 transitional forms were not disputed, this would still be an almost infinitesimally small proportion compared to the vast number of fossils thought to exist. It'd be less than one hundredth of a percent of the fossil record. If evolution were to be observable through the fossil record alone, we'd need to see millions of undisputed transitional forms. Instead, we have mere handfuls of fossils supposed to be transitional that are highly contested. The fossil record doesn't even remotely provide observational proof for evolution, changes from one kind to another. Instead, we see just the opposite. We see sudden appearance of creatures, often in mass extinction events, and when we first see creatures, they're fully formed already. We don't see any precursor sorts of transitional creatures. We see creatures fully formed. And then their stasis or sameness of species, that's to say kind. In other words, uh, when we see a creature uh, at a certain layer in the fossil record, throughout the rest of the fossil record, we see the same creature. As an example, we see our friends, the trilobites, as low as the Cambrian layer. And shocker, as we go up the uh, strata, trilobites still look like trilobites. It's as though God meant what he said when he said that he created creatures after their kind, according to their kind. So contrary to the idea that, that the fossil record provides undisputable observational proof for evolution, it actually creates a lot of problems for the evolutionist. And Darwin himself recognized that when he said the number of intermediate varieties which have formerly existed be truly enormous. Why then is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. And this, perhaps, is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against this theory. This was said several hundred years ago, and it's still true. We don't see 
any missing links. And not only do we not see uh, observational evidence of a change in kinds in the fossil record, no one can point to a transitional feature walking around today, a transitional form, that is, walking around today, nor do we have any record of it in human history. The first mention of it occurred in, in Darwin's writing, to my knowledge, several hundred years ago, and that was Darwin claiming that he was observing the effects of evolution in, in finches in the Galapagos and, and things like that, which leads us to our next consideration. The supposed mechanism for driving changes in kinds into other kinds is that of natural selection. But what is it and how does it work? What is selecting what in natural selection? Have you ever thought about that? Well, we, we get the, the gist, I think. The idea is that creatures have been overproducing offspring for eons, that this uh, overproduction of offspring leads to a scarcity of resources, a struggle for survival, that genetic variation and mutation led to a variety of slightly different characteristics, very slight differences uh, among creatures, and that those with the characteristics most suited for survival are the ones that, that pass on, and with that, survival of the fittest, if you will, you have evolution, small changes over eons of time. That's the idea. But if you really drill down into natural selection, you realize it's just a personification of nature. The idea that nature is selecting life, how creatures will evolve, how they'll develop. The reason Darwin thought this was viable was because he thought all it would take would be very small changes, and we, we see that, over a long enough time. If you have that time, why couldn't it have happened? Well, well let's look at why it couldn't have. But before we, we examine that, we need to understand an important concept, and that is that changes in animals recur, uh, occur internally rather than externally, from within. It's DNA, the basic building block of life, that ultimately determines the physical characteristics we have, and changes to creatures have to happen at the DNA level. So the heart of natural selection is genetic variation and mutation. This is the natural process by which it's supposed that DNA development takes place. And we need to be clear that adaptation in light of one's environment is not only possible, but abundantly evident around us. Animals do undergo change, even significant change, rapidly. But again, we need to remember that animals can only change according to what is already programmed into them at the DNA level. Think about it in terms of a computer. We're getting pretty advanced with our artificial intelligence and marine, marine, machine learning technology. But even still, these programs that we have can only adapt in the ways we've specifically designed them to. You might talk to a rather sophisticated chatbot that is learning how to converse in a more human-like way, but it's still a chatbot designed for that thing, and it's not going to morph into an operating system. That's outside of its boundaries. <laughs> it's not sentient. <laughs> well, that's how adaptation works. God has programmed creatures he made with DNA sequencing that is still very, very much more advanced than even the most high-tech stuff we have today. Animals have external, uh, they, they have sensors to take in stimuli from their environment, and the genetic code, if then logic, if you will, that dictates how they can adapt to those environments. The change comes from within, it's not the environment imposing change on creatures. And this can happen very significant, uh, quickly and produce significant change. For example, when a male black spot angelfish dies, there's a need for a protector in the community of angelfish. So the largest female uh, angelfish morphs into a male in a matter of two weeks. Quite a rapid and significant change, I think you'll agree. But importantly, that and, and all other examples of adaptation still 
fail to meet the definition of evolution, which is what? A change in kind. Though creatures undergo incredible biological changes, they are locked into their kind. They don't change from it. All we have to do is ask the question, what did the fill in the blank become? Whenever someone is saying evolution happened here, evolution is happening here, what did the blank become? We'll use the classic example. What did the finches become, Darwin's finches? Anyone think they know? They're still finches. <laughs> that's, that's adaptation, that's not evolution. So the, despite the personification of environment as an actor in the process of evolution, we know environments can't rewrite DNA itself. So evolution, if it's going to work for us, would have to first involve the development of DNA itself internally. And then you can build out from there to get the sorts of physical changes that we see. So now two reasons why evolution won't work for us. One, genetic entropy, the concept that DNA is lost, information is lost and degraded over time, not gained. Even the simplest of living organisms are highly complex. Mutations, indiscriminate alterations of such complexity are much more likely to be harmful than beneficial. The vast majority of mutations are deleterious, from the word delete. This is one of the most well-established principles of evolutionary genetics, supported by both molecular and quantitative uh, geneticists. These quotes are, are from secular scientists that uh, deny creationism. So we've got a system that's dependent on successive mutation and genetic variation to produce significant increases in information, mutation that's leading to beneficial information and progress, development. But in everything that we can observe, just the opposite is happening. Information is degrading over time rather than advancing. Well, I don't see the indisputable science behind evolution there either. Don't know about you. Of course, the fact that no exception to the law of increasing entropy has ever been observed does not prove that such a thing never happened. It simply shows that such ideas are outside the scope of science. Evolutionists are free to believe in such singularities by faith if they wish, but they have no right to impose them on unsuspecting young minds in the name of science. If anything, genetic entropy points to the idea of a young Earth. In short, if the world were even several hundred thousand years old, genetic entropy means that we have, would have long since become extinct. Okay, now remember that evolution is, is supposed to work via minute changes taking place over eons of time. That's the only way that it can work, right? Well, the complexity of life is such that there's really no such thing as small change, minute change. DNA is often called the basic building block of life, but don't let that fool you. We need a, a whole lot of basic building blocks to make life happen. To illustrate, the uh, DNA helix we see here is like a ladder with each rung uh, being a different nucleotide represented by the letters A, C, G, T. If each of these letters were equivalent to a letter in our alphabet, then in one human cell, there's as much information as in 1,000 books. A pinhead size of DNA has about as much information as there would be in 500 piles of books that reach the moon or one pile of books that reaches the sun. That's a pinhead size of DNA. For perspective, conservative estimates for how many cells humans have in their bodies put them at 75 million times that what we can fit on our pinhead, 30, 30 trillion total. So we've got 75 million piles of books reaching the sun within one human body. That sounds pretty complex to me, but we can't stop there. 
all parts of an irreducibly complex unit must be present or the unit fails. Paul was talking about this on Tuesday. He gave us the example of a mousetrap. All elements in a mousetrap are necessary or the mousetrap doesn't function as a mousetrap. Said differently, the complexity of a mousetrap is irreducible because if you did reduce it, it would break down. Make sense? Well, there are units of irreducible complexity all over the place and at all levels, and they're interdependent. At the microscopic level, for instance, we know that DNA and protein need each other. We were talking about protein on Tuesday and how impossible the odds are that that would have come from nothing. Well, and we just talked about DNA. Well, you need both of those things at the same time or it doesn't work, it breaks down. The uh, incredible development of DNA through evolution happens and the world is going crazy, except unfortunately, protein didn't happen at the same time. So it's all for naught. <laughs> Moving up a few levels, humans have many organs and systems that are inter interdependent. Moving up from there to the macro level, ecosystems depend on very uh, finely balanced food chains, very delicate food chains. So there's this incredible balance of interwoven dependencies in nature that exponentially raise the complexity hurdle evolution would have to jump to be plausible. You can't have minute changes over eons of time because you have all these systems that need to be in place simultaneously. They would have needed to come together in an instant as if someone created them at the same time. As Darwin put it, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. But I can find no such case. He didn't have the science, um, the evidence that, that we have today. Only God knows whether he would have accepted uh, the truth today, but at least then he recognized the problem with evolution. So we've seen that there's really not observable, undisputable evidence for evolution. And unfortunately for naturalists, those claiming that everything we see can be explained in natural terms, there isn't any irrefutable evidence for the idea of an old earth either. Why not? Well, interestingly, no one can measure age. You can't measure age. You can't, uh, it, it's not a physical property like mass or volume. You can't go to Home Depot and pick up an age measurement tool and then figure out how old something is. This isn't something we tend to think about because um, it's easy to calculate how old a lot of things in our lives are. We're asked throughout our lives how old we are. That's usually a pretty easy question to answer, right? We're told with a significant level of certainty how old certain historical buildings are and even when certain historical events took place. But how do we know the age of these things? How do we date them? How do we even know how old we ourselves are? Well, generally, people who were there tell us, usually our, our parents. They can tell us down to the minute when we began to exist outside the womb. So then knowing the start date with certainty, the calculation is pretty simple. You just take the present time and subtract from the beginning. The only way to know age with certainty is to have observed the beginning either directly or to have a witness who did uh, inform you, so indirect observation. When we don't know the start date, however, the best we can do is estimate the age. We can't know because we can't measure age. There are even plenty of human beings who don't know how old they are or when their birthday is because for uh, often an assortment of reasons those who were there hadn't communicated that effectively to them. And th this is where the analogy breaks down because we have a lot of other humans to compare people to and it's a relatively small time frame that we're working with. So we, usually we can make a pretty close estimation as to how old someone is. When we talk about the age of the earth, however, no human was uh, immediately present for its beginning and documenting with records that have survived to today, 
So things get much more complicated, and we have to rely on um, assumptions. They, they play a much bigger role. Take radiometric dating, for instance, perhaps the most cited support for old Earth claims. The key idea behind radiometric dating is that the proportion of certain parent-child elements, unstable, stable elements, changes over time through decay from unstable to stable. So if we measure the current decay rate, which we can do, and backtrack, extrapolate that date back from the current proportion of those elements, we can supposedly find out how long something has been decaying and, and hence when it began, how old it is, right? Well, kind of. Uh, as long as our assumptions are accurate, then yes, that will give us an accurate age. But it is dependent on our assumptions. And I want to note three assumptions that such calculations depend on. To make an age calculation about anything that we didn't observe or that somebody else didn't observe, we need to know the quantity of the starting element in radiometric dating. We assume the proportion of the elements when the decay began, usually around zero. We need to know the rate of change. We need to know that it remained constant. Otherwise, extrapolating back from our current measurement doesn't make any sense. That breaks down. And we need to know that this decay has been a closed system, that nothing has left the system or entered the system to impact the decay in any way. Does that make sense? Let's illustrate with this fireplace. You walk up on a fire in the woods and you're tasked with determining when the fire started, but there's no person or other evidence there to tell you directly. You don't know by observation. You could try to measure the um, rate at which the fire is diminishing. You could observe the amount of ash that's there, something like that but you're really just missing important information. You don't know how much firewood was there in the first place when the fire began. You don't know whether any wood has been added to the fire or taken from the fire since the fire began. And you don't know whether the amount of wood being burned remained constant or along with the burn rate. If you have a further spread out fire, it's going to burn differently than one that's very condensed upon itself. So because of these unknowns, you just can't know with certainty the age of the fire. You can make assumptions and plug in some estimates as variables in your calculations, but the present and weight of those assumptions means that I think you, you really shouldn't be dogmatic with your result. Because if you're being honest, you don't know. You can't prove your claim. Similarly, radiometric dating really can't provide observational, verifiable evidence of the age of anything. It relies on assumptions, even more than these three, but I chose to focus on these. In fact, it, it kind of relies on, on circular reasoning. You start with the claim the Earth is old, and if the claim is the Earth is old, I'm going to apply that second assumption we talked about, the idea that the rate that I measure today is the rate that has always been the, the decay rate in that uh, system. That's a uniformitarian assumption. The way things are going now is at the same rate they always have. And if you apply uniformitarian assumptions in your dating, you will get a calculation that says the Earth is old. Does that prove that the Earth is old. No, it proves that if you assume the Earth is old, your calculation will tell you that you're right. But contrastly, if you assume the Earth is young, your calculation will prove that you're right. So assumptions play a pretty major role and are very important to the conversation. And as it turns out, the assumptions used in radiometric dating, uh, we, we have good reason to reject at least in some cases. Rocks that we know formed recently, like past 50 years recently because of observation, have significantly higher than zero proportion uh, in, in the radioactive decay elements. So the assumption of starting element at, at zero is at, at the very least not always true. 
Furthermore, conditions that existed during the global flood, we've been seeing how catastrophic, catastrophic it was, would have been more than sufficient to have a drastic impact on decay rates. So if you're trying to say that old earth conclusions from radiometric dating prove an old earth, the burden of proof is on you to explain why that's the only plausible explanation. You don't have to just prove that that one's right. You have to prove why everything else is wrong. It's implausible. And if the uh, flood was global as we believe it was, we can make perfect sense. It's, it's more than plausible that uh, decay rates would have sped up. It's important to keep in mind that these radiometric methods have often produced wildly inaccurate results, skewing ages to be much older than they really were. We have a few examples on the slide here of, of situations where because of volcanic activity and things of the like, we had rocks of known ages that these methods provided wildly inaccurate dates for. And if it's providing inaccurate uh, dating for rocks with known ages, I, I don't know if it's that trustworthy to date rocks with unknown ages and origins. Furthermore, uh, geologist John Morris noted, when the same rock is dated by more than one method, it will often yield different ages. And when the rock is dated more than one time by the same method, it will often give different results. There's inconsistency that heavily tarnishes the trustworthiness of these methods. They're really sliding from that holy grail of indisputability that we started with from these uh, quotes. And these assumptions are not just necessary in radiometric dating. Because we can't measure age and weren't there to observe creation ourselves, every dating method we could conceive of relies on the same assumptions. There's just no way around it because we can't measure age. I think we have time to note uh, something that's really interesting to me. I think probably the biggest problem scientifically for young earth creationism is distant starlight. In this instance, I think those assumptions, they're still involved, but I think they're, they're a little bit more grounded. The physics behind measuring how far stars away is pretty sound, right? Um, so we have this question, how can we see the light of stars that are billions of light years away if the Earth is young. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> How do creationists explain this first? Well, we've had a, a variety of views posited throughout the years. The one that I held for a long time was out of mature creation, the idea that God created things with the appearance of age. Um, and some interesting um, issues have been pointed out related to that, uh, including the idea that when you see a supernova, a star that's exploded very, very far away, if God created things with the appearance of age, then that star never really actually existed. Instead, God is just playing a video for us, if you will. And while God can do whatever he wants, I think there are other implications um, with the mature creation view that pose some problems to our theology proper. Um, within the realm of, of naturalism, there have been several relativistic theories um, proposed because we know that time doesn't always function the way that we experience it here on earth. Theory of relativity, um, there are some much smarter men than I who have devoted a lot of time coming up with these ways that seek to explain how this could have happened, and it revolves around um, the idea that God stretched the heavens. We see that very frequently in Scripture, which is surprising to me. Um, but there are reasons for, there are problems with those theories as well. We have an esotropic synchrony convention, relatively recently proposed. The uh, convention chosen by Dr. Jason Lyle because we can't measure the one-way speed of light. 
I'm not going to talk about that more because, frankly, it's really confusing. And there are YouTube videos on it if you want to understand that, if you can understand that. Um, but essentially, uh, it's, it's theoretically possible that the one-way speed of light, in other words, light traveling from stars to us, happens at an infinite speed, that it's immediate, but that the speed of life, uh, speed of light everywhere else is moving at half the uh, speed that we measure it at. Because when we measure it, we need a mirror and a long hallway, if you will, and we measure the average of the distance. So this is a convention. If you choose the anisotropic synchrony convention, all of your calculations will make sense. If you choose the isotropic synchrony convention, the idea that the speed of light is the same in every direction, it will make sense. It's just a convention. So it's not really falsifiable. And while it's interesting, I have no idea. What is interesting to me is this um, concept of matured creation that Dr. Danny Faulkner puts forth, the uh, dasha um, idea. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that correctly. That's a Hebrew word. And he derives this from the Hebrew word behind sprout in Genesis 1.11. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed. Vegetation and uh, fruit trees bearing fruit, that takes up to years to take place. So God creates these things, and he creates them small, and then they sprout, they grow. He uh, miraculously speeds up their growth to the point that they're functioning the way that he wanted them to be in the creation week, right? So along those lines, the reason that he calls it the Dasha um, solution is this. He says, I propose that the light had to abnormally grow or shoot its way to the earth to fulfill this function. Notice that this is not the result of some natural process any more than the shooting up of plants on day three was. Instead, this is a miraculous, abnormally fast process. Rather than light moving very quickly, I suggest that it was space itself that did the moving, carrying light along with it, as in when God stretched the heavens. So there's a slight distinction between matured creation and mature creation. Matured creation says God created all of the celestial bodies. They're there. They exist. And then he sped up the process of the, the light travel so that at least by the time that Adam was created, they saw the celestial bodies. And um, Danny Faulkner and, and myself will certainly recognize that this is a miraculous view, right? And I don't see any problem with that at all. Uh, we're talking about the creation week. So every one of us, unless we completely deny God's existence and the historicity of him being involved in creation, have to recognize that at some point we go from miraculous creative events to God kind of turning over the um, operation of the world, if you will, to these laws of nature that he designed. But um, so the, the difference between something like this relativistic, uh, these theories and matured creation is just where you put the shift from the miraculous creation events to what can be explained th through natural science. Does that make sense? And I, I would go on the side of miraculous creation with that. And that is not something that a secular scientist wants to hear. It's not an um, acceptable argument to them. But fortunately for us, they don't have an answer either to a lot of the cosmological things that we see. Even Big Bang theorists have serious problems on their hands um, with cosmology, we're able to, with advanced technology, see further and further out into space. And with a Big Bang model, you're expecting to see fewer and fewer stars as you're getting farther out. And you're also expecting to see less development in those stars. And um, instead, what we see is that as we're looking farther into the reaches of space than we ever have, there's way more stars out there 
than we ever thought there could be if the Big Bang was true. Not only that, they're very developed. They're spiral galaxies and things like that that the Big Bang model just cannot make any sense of. Furthermore, we have the uh, horizon problem. If everything is spreading out from this one point, um, there wouldn't, we wouldn't expect uniformity in the universe in space. We would expect vast areas of very cold temperatures, vast areas of warm temperatures, and um, what we see instead is uniformity throughout the universe. So um, in conclusion of this little distant starlight subtopic, the evidence in cosmology doesn't really fit any naturalistic model. So with that being the case, all of a sudden the miracle view of the Dasha matured creation uh, starts to make a little bit more sense. If you can explain it through natural means, the only way you can explain it is through supernatural means. So I hope these ideas have been sufficient to support my claim that the ideas of evolution and deep time or old earth are far from observational and irrefutable science as they're dogmatically claimed to be. And with the rest of this session, I want to consider evidence that is observable, what we can see and observe and what that points to. And we'll, we'll wrap up in, in 15 minutes. We will have a break. Observable evidence, as we'll see, favors catastrophism and a young earth. And we've been looking at these things all week. Um, to provide a well-rounded paradigm, which is what we're trying to do, I want to clarify something. Again, dating methods are not completely invalidated and useless simply because they involve assumptions. The evidence of decay that we observe is real, and it would be unwarranted to deny it. But the mere presence of decay, or the evidence of it, if you will, doesn't prove age. And we just need to take calculations made with assumptions with a grain of salt and heavily vet those assumptions. In fact, if anything, the major focus should be on the, the, how reasonable the assumptions are because they more or less dictate the outcome, the, the conclusions that we're going to come to with our science. So we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, if you will. We want to recognize that the principle and measurements behind dating will provide accurate results, as I mentioned, if accurate assumptions are applied. In fact, carbon-14 dating is used to date things like the Dead Sea Scrolls. We would uh, have to reject the provided dates, at least from carbon-14 dating, for the Dead Sea Scrolls if we're just going to blanket reject radiometric dating altogether, which I don't think we should do. So now that we've made sure we clarify that, we have a well-rounded paradigm, let's turn to a, a common misconception related to carbon dating specifically. While some might think that, that radiocarbon dating can calculate the age of rocks at millions of years old, the reality is that it cannot be used to date anything over 100,000 years, and that's being very generous, very conservative. Remember, this is assuming we're still making assumptions, but this is assuming that the decay rate hasn't drastically slowed down for a long time, that it's been constant. So theoretically, and a secular scientist would uh, acknowledge this, if we find measurable carbon-14 in something, it can't be older than really 60,000 years old. Unfortunately for naturalists, we've been finding a lot of carbon-14 and even soft tissue and other things in various fossils. In 2005, a paleontologist and molecular biologist, Mary Schweitzer and her team, first discovered these things in a dinosaur fossil that was supposedly 68 million years old. But again, carbon-14 can't last that long. So do you think these scientists said, well, I guess our assumptions were off and these dinosaurs must have lived less than 100,000 years ago. I, we were wrong. No, interesting, they did not do that. They started to say, as the scientific community still maintains, that there's just some method of preservation that we aren't aware of yet. Now, this is subtle, but I want to point out that what's happened is that they've just denied, secular scientists have just denied 
the assumptions that decay rate is always constant at the rate we observe today. They also deny the assumption that the systems are always closed. These are the very assumptions that um, old earth radiometric dating rely on. So we've got a license from them to recognize that sometimes those assumptions don't fit, right? And in this case, I think their science is very poor and they're refusing to maintain those assumptions because it doesn't fit the, their bias. It, it doesn't, it's not confirming what they want it to. But we have that license from the secular science community. Interesting, isn't it? Carbon-14 exists in measurable amounts in even the most ancient rock formations. And this organic material points to a young Earth that can be no more than 50,000 years old. One more thing on radiometric dating. As an isotope emits alpha particles, radio halos are created in the rock mineral matrix surrounding it. However, a radio halo does not begin to form until around 500 million decays have occurred. At today's decay rates, it would take nearly 1 billion years to form visible radio halos. You with me? The existence of 238U and 232TH radio halos would come as no great surprise to most geologists who embrace the secular paradigm for Earth's ages until they attempt to reconcile their existence in rocks of the tertiary and late Paleozoic Mesozoic periods, which secular science claims were within the last 100 years. Interesting, when you apply their assumptions, you get conflicting results. Either the granitic rocks of the tertiary and late Paleozoic Mesozoic eras have been substantially misdated, or there has been a significant increase in the decay rate of 238U sometime in Earth's past. Neither of these options is very attractive to the secular scientific community because neither fits their dating model. So my conclusion when it comes to dating methods is that just like the fireplace in the woods, we don't have enough information to know, and we shouldn't be dogmatic. We should favor the calculations with the assumptions that are more grounded, but still with a grain of salt because they involve assumptions. Okay, moving on from radiocarbon dating and um, wrapping this up. Contrary to uniformitarian thought, sedimentary rocks and other geologic features don't require millions of years to form. Empirical experiments provide solid evidence that they can and do form very quickly. Much evidence exists that the majority of Earth's rocks were rapidly deposited by water. This is consistent with a global flood. Paul did a great job of talking about this, so we're going to go pretty quickly through. But I, I love this slide. This is from uh, Mount St. Helens as well. We've got a person there because of the metric system. <laughs> and look how small this person is to these layers. In secular science, you're saying each inch is representing millions of years, and all of this happened in the span of two years. Interesting. We see the little Grand Canyon that was carved out from this. Um, even secular science agrees that something called the Missoula Flood um, is responsible for quite a bit of uh, geologic effects. Um, it was a massive ice age lake that was blocked from drainage, but eventually that uh, blockage was ruptured and a massive lake plowed across Washington in about two days, destroying and reshaping the U.S. landscape from Montana to the Pacific Ocean. And I think this happened relatively shortly after, after the global flood. This caused the channeled Skablands, the Colum Columbia River Gorge, Dry Falls State Park. It's dry now, hence the name. But this used to be larger, it was, it was as a waterfall, larger than any waterfall we have on Earth today. So there was a lot of water pouring over the Dry Falls at some point. And the Missoula flood caused even more than that. 
Only the flood can provide a reason for the blanket sandstones found on multiple continents at the same time, mega sequence after mega sequence. Only the flood can explain the massive extent of unique rock units like salt and shirt across vast regions of the continents. Only a global flood can bury the same types of fossils in the same approximate order all over the world at the same time as the sea level rose higher and higher. The true global nature of the geologic column is one of the most is one of the strongest evidences we have of a worldwide flood. It confirms exactly what the Bible tells us. This is also from is Genesis history. And it shows that we have continent-wide deposits of sediment, these sedimentary rock layers. They're not local. They're not um, isolated. Something that we would expect if a worldwide catastrophic event was shaking up the world. The global flood is also the best way to explain the ice age. To get an ice age, you don't necessarily need colder winters. You need colder summers so that the ice and snow won't melt. We have an acronym to remember what you need for an ice age, and it's heat. H, you need hot oceans, which leads to evaporation. You need aerosols. Why? These things are kind of forming a boundary in the atmosphere that's going to reduce the amount of sunlight and heat that can get to the earth. All of these things are more than reasonable um, considering the degree of volcanic activity and things like that that would have been going on during the flood. It's interesting, the Mount Pinatubo eruption in the Philippines released aerosols that spread very far and is responsible for lowering the temperature of the entire earth by one degree for two years. Interesting. And lastly, the T of heat is time, and especially a short period of time. In evolutionary models, you have things like volcanic activity, things like that. But again, Mount Pinatubo, one degree. That's pretty interesting to me, but it's not going to cause an ice age. You need a lot of catastrophic activity in a short period of time so that the effects will compound and lead to an ice age. The flood is the best explanation of the ice age. It's also the uh, best explanation of, of the fossil record, which I'm not going to explain too much, except to say that we see tons of marine and land animals um, sprinkled right next to each other in the fossil record. And we see large and small marine creatures deposited all over continents. Huh, how did they get in the middle of North America? They're on all uh, this uh, dinosaur, aquatic dinosaur, is found on all seven continents. How? Interesting. So in conclusi on, <laughs> remember, um, I was talking about how we do know the age of many things with certainty because someone who was there told us. Well, as it turns out, and as we all know, someone was there at the beginning of the universe, at the beginning of uh, the earth, at the beginning of the existence of humankind, God. And he did give us inf enough information to know when the earth began and how the course of human history has progressed since then. So we don't need to rely on assumptions in dating methods at all because we can just look and see what God, who is there, has to say about the age of the earth. And he says, as, as Jacob pointed out, um, through genealogies and the like, we know that the earth is, is young. God gives us evidence that the earth is young. Thank you. With that, uh, we'll take a quick five-minute break, and we'll come back for a rapid conclusion.